Hey guys, I see some people are starting to roll in. Hi, Neil. Hello, Kevin. Hi, David. How are you? Emily, I feel like it's been a long time. Nice to see ya. Well, we got about three more minutes, so we'll just let folks uh, hop on. And in the meantime, just, um, I'll say this a couple of times, but um, be sure throughout the webinar, even if it's not a time for questions, feel free to write your questions down in the chat um, or the Q&A se uh, section. Um, just don't wait until uh, question time. So we'll, we'll kind of gather all those questions and, and be able to answer most of them when we can. So feel free to do that. My window is open and my computer is near my window and I would like to know if anyone can hear my chickens yelling right now. <laughs> okay, that's good. Just to reassure you, there are no rogue chickens um, participating in this session today. Well, maybe they should. I mean, they're very uh, intelligent and funny, so. Well, chickens are totally trainable. You can teach them to play the piano and do all kinds of things. Yeah, we haven't gotten there. No? <laughs> uh, I have trained them to yell at me for some reason. I'm not sure how that came about, but. That's a, that's a reward mechanism. You're, you've rewarded them for yelling at you, and so they keep doing it. I always tell them they're going to get us kicked out of the neighborhood. I'm like, shh. <laughs> Hey, Sandy. <laughs> uh, oh, we got like one more minute. Hey, Mike. Jasmine. Um, so now that a few more people have joined, I just want to remind you guys that if you have a question throughout the session and you, but it's not necessarily a time to ask questions, please feel free to write it, type it out in the chat or the Q&A box and um, we will get to the questions uh, when we can, so. And let's begin here quickly before we start the session with a polling question. Yeah, what do you hope to take away from today's extended producer responsibility keynote speech? Looks like about half of you have voted, so take a second to really uh, think about this important question. <laughs> wow. So far, we're almost neck and neck on this, so this ought to be interesting. Yeah. Well, I would say almost, almost all of you have voted, and Wow, it's truly, truly neck and neck. Like it's not even worth almost uh, telling you the percentages because I would say like the lowest one is learn more about the pros and cons of EPR, but generally almost everything is exactly the same. So we have a diverse crew of folks that are pumped to learn about all the different uh, areas of EPR. So that's good. Well, it's 9.01, so let's get started. I'll end the poll here. And those are the results. Sorry, I thought I could show you there quick. Good, I think it's good for everybody to see where everybody else is at. Yeah, totally. So yeah, I mean, yeah, that was neck and neck, that's for sure. But our overall winner is all of the above. 
Yeah. <laughs> at 38%. Perfect. Hopefully we can meet all those needs as we go through here. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining. This is day two of the 31st Summit for Recycling, which is crazy. Uh, yesterday was so uh, wonderful. There were such valuable sessions. I just really enjoyed myself, so I hope you guys did too. Um, this is our EPR keynote session, but you know, certainly be sure to check out the Business Partner Showcase. There's two sessions of that um, this afternoon or early this or late this morning, I should say. And then more really great sessions about circularity, some policy stuff, organics. Um, so it's going to be another really great day. So with that, I would absolutely love to introduce you to our wonderful facilitator for this session, Kate Bailey. Kate is the Policy and Research Director at EcoCycle. And she is a national expert on best practices in creating zero waste communities and has worked directly with local government, state legislators, citizen groups, business leaders, and brands to advance zero waste solutions as a critical step toward addressing our climate crisis. Kate is a rock star and I'm so excited for her to facilitate this session. And so with that, Kate, here you go. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I am uh, thrilled to be here as I know everyone else on this panel is as well. Uh, but it is with a little bit of remorse I can't introduce Risa in person. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely get her out to Colorado sometime soon. Uh, Risa, that, that's definitely a promise. Um, but meanwhile, we're doing the best we can. And so my pleasure to virtually introduce you to Risa Domino. Risa is a longtime rock star in the waste recycling, product stewardship, environmental economic development space. She has over 25 years of experience and really diverse experience working on all sides of the table. So Risa is currently working with RRS as a senior consultant, focusing on corporate clients and collaborative initiatives to improve recovery, sustainability, and facilitate product stewardship. Previously, Risa has served as the Director of Policy for the National Association of PET Container Resources, or NACCOR. So she worked as the, uh, worked for the Trade Association for PET Packaging, so been on the industry side of things. And Risa has also a lot of experience in state government, where she worked for the state of New York and helped develop their Beyond Waste Plan and their EPR legislation for electronics. Risa is also a founder and current board member of the New York Product Stewardship Council. She really brings a wealth of experience to this topic and many others, if you're ever looking to pick her brain on things. Um, she's currently based in New York. And so I will kick it over to Risa in a second. I first wanted to just share a little bit of context of why EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, is a, a very timely topic for today's keynote. Last year, Senate Bill 55 on end market development authorized CDPHE to look, do a literature review about EPR and look at what's happening with industry initiatives and initiatives in other states. So CDPHE is in the process of conducting that review and there's going to be good opportunity for stakeholder engagement in that process. So I'll throw a link in the chat for people who want to get involved with that, that process. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, during today's webinar. And, and this will be the first of probably many conversations we'll have about EPR in the, the coming months. So my pleasure to introduce Risa Domino to guide us through all of these important issues around EPR. Thanks, Risa. Thank you, Kate, and uh, thanks to all of you. I do wish I was there in person. Um, feels a little weird to be doing this online, but, uh, but we'll do our best. Um, and uh, as those of you who know me know, there's nothing I like more than to talk about trash and especially about policy around trash. So um, really, really pleased to have this opportunity. Um, so just a little outline of what I'm gonna cover today. Um, little quick introduction to RRS, and um, as Kate mentioned, I'm a founder of the New York Product Stewardship Council. So we'll talk a little bit about that group and what we've done. 
um, spend some time talking about what EPR actually is and how it has been applied in the US, um, some program performance uh, metrics and, and studies that we have. Um, then we'll do a little bit of a dive into EPR for packaging and printed paper. That's your conventional curbside materials. Um, and then close out talking about some of the challenges as we move into this arena and, um, and where to go from here as you consider the path forward for Colorado. And we'll have stops along the way um, for questions and for some discussion. Um, so I really hope that you all will um, engage with me and with Kate as we, as we move through this agenda. So um, you all are probably fairly familiar with RRS since we have an office in Boulder and we have some fabulous people out there. Um, we've been around a little over 30 years. Uh, we do a variety of projects in the space of material recovery, corporate sustainability, and organics recovery. Um, we have a pretty broad skill set. Uh, folks like me who are sort of planners, uh, policy people, generalists, and then we have economists, we have um, engineers, uh, we have communications folks, kind of the whole gamut. Um, about 50 people, uh, mostly around the US, so we have a couple folks scheduled, uh, based in Europe, um, and more than 660 years of experience. So yes, we are pretty old. <laughs> and a lot of us have been in the field a long time, uh, bringing a lot of different experience to these issues. Um, so just to talk a second about the New York Product Stewardship Council, um, we formed the council in 2009. It actually grew out of the state materials management uh, process, uh, planning process, where we were developing the Beyond Waste Plan and having these conversations with local governments and stakeholders about what was going, coming down the pike. And um, the New York State Association for Solid Waste Management, which is our statewide organization for um, public works directors essentially um, founded the council really out of a recognition that you know they're really struggling to keep up with what's coming down the belt so to speak um, as local government folks uh, as many of you know you have to manage whatever is in the waste stream and you don't really have a lot of control or influence over what that is and um, that's becoming more and more challenging as the years go on and so a number of other statewide organizations joined with um, what we call NISA SWAM, so the state recycling organization, the state SWANA chapter, uh, to create the council. Um, we are supported uh, and fiscally sponsored by the Product Stewardship Institute. And one thing that's interesting is you may know there are a number of product stewardship councils, most state-based um, in the Northeast, uh, in California, and, there, uh, and there's the Northwest Product Stewardship Council, which includes Oregon and Washington, we are unique among councils in that we are not entirely made up of local governments. Um, our board of directors is uh, predominantly local government, but we also include uh, recycling businesses, um, people like myself, recycling professionals, and members of the environmental community. So it was important for us in New York to have a multi-stakeholder approach as we moved forward with uh, product stewardship and EPR. So um, we essentially work to promote EPR as a core material management strategy in New York, um, really try to get good EPR policy in place and follow through with the implementation um, and do a lot of education around EPR, what it means. So what we've been able to accomplish so far is essentially five pieces of legislation targeting electronics, rechargeable batteries, mercury thermostats, pharmaceuticals, and paint. Um, we are now working on carpets, mattresses, packaging, and um, alkaline batteries, among other things. So with that introduction, um, let's talk a little bit about what EPR is, make sure we're all grounded um, in what we mean here. So extended producer re responsibility is essentially a policy approach and a practice where producers or brands um, and, and uh, manufacturers take responsibility for their products or their packages at the end of their useful life. So this may mean that they pay for programs or take fiscal responsibility. This may mean that they operate programs um, or take physical responsibility or some combination of the two. 
Um, and it's important when you think about extended producer responsibility, who is the producer? Um, this gets a, extremely complicated in some cases, and, and especially in the packaging space, where the producer of a cereal box is a, uh, what we would call a converter. They're not the responsible party in an EPR program. The responsible party, the producer and extended producer responsibility is the brand owner or the manufacturer who's selling the product or the package not the person who actually makes it necessarily. Um, so there's some discussion around what is EPR versus product stewardship. Um, a number of organizations got together a bunch of years ago and, and put out some definitions for EPR and product stewardship. And generally it breaks down, EPR is a mandatory program, so it's legislated. Product stewardship is typically voluntary. However, um, you will see cases where there are mandatory programs that are referred to as product stewardship. Um, so just keep that in mind. This is a rule of thumb. Um, essentially, they refer to the same conceptual framework that a producer brand is taking responsibility for their product um, or their package at the end of their useful life. So it's important to understand as we think about yeah, um, EPR that there are a lot of different ways it can play out. As I mentioned, sometimes it's physical responsibility, meaning operational responsibility, and sometimes it's a financial responsibility. And the programs really fall all over um, the map in terms of that spectrum from operational to to uh, operational responsibility and financial responsibility. So I'm gonna highlight just three here on this slide, but you can see um, there's a whole variety of different ways this can play out and really um, how that works depends on the legislative mandate um, and the structure of the program. So um, just to give you a few examples, uh, one that you all are familiar with in Colorado is paint care. Um, we have that on the high level of operational responsibility because paint care essentially is responsible for developing and implementing a program that meets certain targets and obligations. It is on the lower end of financial responsibility because that program is funded by, through a fee that is paid by consumers um, or distributors into paint care. So, um, the paint companies themselves don't have that direct financial responsibility, but they do gather that money and they have full operational responsibility for meeting those obligations. On the opposite end, um, on the lower right, you have the electronics programs in Connecticut and Maine. Um, electronics is one of those uh, products that has uh, programs all over the spectrum. Um, but to speak to Connecticut and Maine specifically, the legislation there requires local governments to establish um, electronics collection programs or collection sites. Uh, and um, it, the, the state approves a certain number of recyclers that meet certain, certain performance um, requirements and downstream vendor requirements. Uh, so those certain vendors can recycle materials from those communities and the producers pay the vendor for that cost. So the producers have uh, full financial responsibility, but local governments really and recyclers have the operational responsibility. So that's sort of on this high financial, low operational end of the spectrum. And then on the upper right, we have the high um, financial and high operational responsibility example of the packaging and printed paper in British Columbia. Um, in this program, uh, Recycle BC, which is a producer responsibility organization for the brands in BC, is required to meet certain performance objectives, meet certain recycling targets, um, and they are required to implement the programs that do that. Um, local governments have no obligation to provide recycling services. If they choose to provide recycling services, they do that on contract to Recycle BC. So Recycle BC um, essentially organizes the collection system, contracts out for those services, contracts out for processing, markets the materials, whole nine yards. So they have the both the um, 
operational and financial responsibility. So as you think about moving forward um, for different products and, and different materials, there's a whole host of choices you can make. Sometimes um, the, the, the um, you know, you need to look at what you have uh, in the state, what your infrastructure is, what your needs are, the particular material or product and what its particular needs are, and then determine where on the spectrum you wanna be. So what are the things that make um, EPR programs successful. Uh, convenient collection is key. Um, and we know that from, uh, from municipal programs, right? But the EPR programs allow us to build on that convenience, sometimes add collection in places where it's not economically viable when it's publicly funded. Um, uh, dedicated financing streams. So for those of you who are EPR wonks out there, there's an ongoing debate about um, cost internalization versus fee-based financing. So cost internalization is the brands uh, pay into a fund sort of out of their uh, general fund or out of their um, general operating revenues. Uh, dedicated financing stream is like paint care where there's a specific assessment that goes into a, a fund. Um, what we found is that the programs with dedicated financing streams perform really well uh, because they don't have to fight for funding for other needs and, and they do, there are, are able to set budgets and things. Um, so that works well. Clear responsibility and accountability. Um, who has to meet the targets? What happens if they don't meet the targets? Performance standards. What are those targets? Is it convenient? Do you have to provide service? to a certain percentage of the population? Is it rates and dates? You have to um, uh, uh, recover so many tons or so this percentage by this date. Incentives, um, you know, the bottle bill is the oldest EPR program um, in the United States. Uh, the nickel deposit really works. It still drives people today. Um, and then lastly, oversight and enforcement. Um, other things that can be helpful as you're looking at uh, creating and framing programs, transparency and reporting. Um, it's, it's important to understand what's happening uh, with the funding, with the materials, how are materials being collected, where are they being managed, how are they being managed. It's particularly important with some of the more hazardous materials. Um, that we use these programs for. Uh, similarly, environmental management standards, as I mentioned, in Connecticut and Maine, you have to apply to the state to be a recycler. You have to show what your uh, downstream processing stand, uh, uh, outlets are, that you're meeting certain standards, et cetera. Disposal bans are really helpful in driving participation um, and helping to educate around use of the programs. And then, of course, education and outreach. So why have people looked at EPR um, over the years? Uh, increasing diversion and recovery is a key goal. As I mentioned, um, EPR programs can reach places that are harder to reach with public sector programs, uh, rural communities, for example, multifamily housing, things like that. It provides the resources and the tools uh, to increase access to recycling and increase diversion and recovery reduces cost to government by transferring those costs to the producers and by um, either directly or indirectly to the consumers of those products. Um, in doing so, it incorporates the cost of recycling or end of life management and the cost of the product. And then um, hopefully improves the design of products. This is, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but the the uh, ability to improve the thought being that if producers have to handle the material at the end of their useful life, they will design it for recovery. Um, the jury's still out on sort of how that's working, but we'll talk about that more in a minute. So how has uh, EPR progressed over time in the US? As I mentioned, um, beverage container deposits or bottle bills are really the first operating example we have of EPR. Um, and they were in place well before EPR was a thing. Um, EPR, the term, was coined in 1990 by Thomas Lundquist um, in a report to the Swedish government. Uh, but it essentially captures what the beverage container deposits do, which is create a system managed by the producers or the brands outside of the, the government-managed recycling system in a producer-consumer relationship. 
Um, so what we saw after 1990 was that EPR began to take off in Europe, really focused on packaging. Um, and, uh, and in the US, it's really focused more on uh, problematic or hazardous products. Um, so the first uh, EPR in the US was 1994, rechargeable batteries. Uh, Minnesota was the first state to actually put out a policy saying, hey, product stewardship is something we want to accomplish here. Um, and as you see through the 2000s, I guess we call those the aughts, um, there was a lot of additional movement as we moved into mercury switches, e-scrap, thermostats, um, and more recently, so, so then focused on really products with hazardous components, and then more recently into products that are expensive, bulky, difficult to handle, like paint, carpet, mattresses. So um, there are a lot of EPR policies across the US. They focus on about 14 different categories. As you can see, the categories that have a lot of state programs um, other than beverage containers are the ones that have the most uh, toxic or hazardous components, mercury switches, rechargeable batteries, electronics, um, and then thermostats, paint, and pharmaceuticals is coming up quickly. That's a new one that we've only had in place for a few years, um, but five states have implemented uh, those programs so far. So I think we'll pause here and, uh, and take some questions. I threw a lot of information out there to you all. Awesome, thank you, Risa. And we do have a question, couple questions coming in and a couple I'll queue up that I know you'll cover later as well. And we will kick off another polling question as well. So keep an eye out for your screen on that one. So Risa, Sandy asked a great question about where are there, or what is a good resource that lists which companies have EPR mandates, which states have policies, um, sort of, you know, how do those those policies fall on the spectrum? What would you recommend for good resources for folks? Um, well, uh, the Product Stewardship Institute is an excellent resource um, on uh, on the state laws that are in place. Um, they uh, the the slides here give you a, an overview of which states have legislation um, on which programs. Um, and then there have been a handful of reports done by PSI and by some others um, looking at, uh, you know, different products over time. Um, but so I would encourage you to reach out to the Product Stewardship Institute to get some of that information um, and then follow up with me if there are particular states you're interested in. Um, in terms of corporate product stewardship policies, you know, I'm guessing there's something out there, but I'm not aware of a good sort of one-stop shop um, for those kinds of policies. I know most electronics companies have them, um, and there are certain, you know, industries where, where that there's increasingly in the textiles industry, H&M and others, um, establishing stewardship programs. Um, but I'm not aware of a good kind of one-stop shop for that information, unfortunately. Fair enough. So encouraging everyone to vote if they still haven't voted yet. We've got lots of great questions. I will definitely let a lot of you know that a lot of these questions are going to be coming up. Through, answers to these questions are going to be coming up throughout the talk. We're going to talk about what might be some good next steps for Colorado, uh, including potentially a framework. Um, we can Risa, uh, Ellen asked a little bit about if you can talk, when you talk about product design, things that maybe extend the life of a product, fixability. So if you have any thoughts mm -hmm. on that. Um, and then just one more question we'll ask and then we'll keep going. A little, a little conversation about bottle bills and whether they're actually considered EPR. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so quickly on the reuse or uh, fixability question, um, there is uh, in the electronic space a uh, move called the, a group called the that's advocating right to repair legislation in a number of states. 
Um, this requires electronics manufacturers to make information available that allows you to fix your electronics, things like that. Um, it's an important thing to keep in mind as you're designing programs. A lot of the early e-waste programs did not allow for reuse or refurbishing towards the goals, um, and that's something you need to keep in mind. Um, I think uh, I haven't seen any examples of policy driving extended uh, product life as of yet, but I'm not, I'm not sure it's been studied, so that may be done. Um, as for bottle bills, you know, this is an interesting thing. To me, it's very clear cut that bottle bills, with the exception of California and Hawaii, which are government run and managed um, deposit programs, all of the other deposit programs really fit every criteria of extended producer responsibility um, because they are managed by the brands, distributors, um, they are not taxpayer funded. They are financed either by the brand or by the unclaimed deposit, which is essentially a contribution from uh, the consumer who chooses not to recycle. Um, and they're also paid for by, by um, scrap revenues. So um, that I know that some people argue they are, not, they are not EPR, but I don't see it. To me, they meet every criteria. Again, with the exception of California and Hawaii, which are government run programs where the state has a more um, active role. The state actually collects the deposits and distributes the deposits to the people in the supply chain. In all of the other states, um, the deposits are um, initiated by the distributor. Uh, the programs are operated by distributors or their agents. And again, outside of the taxpayer funded program in a sort of producer consumer relationship as opposed to a consumer taxpayer relationship. Awesome, thank you. Can we throw the results of the poll up on the screen? And then we'll keep going here. These are great questions. We'll definitely have a couple spots where we'll stop for questions. So we'll be able to get some more of these and some discussion at the end. So great job everyone getting in some great questions. And as we can see from the poll results here, folks overwhelmingly felt that all of these benefits of EPR are important for Colorado. So um, good thing we're talking about this and we will let Risa keep going and talk more about program performance. Great. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna go over here is the data that we have um, been able to compile so far on the program performance for EPR uh, programs. And we're gonna show, yes, um, EPR programs typically do increase diversion. They typically do reduce costs to local governments and state governments. Um, and they do incorporate the cost of recycling and end-of-life management into the cost of the project product. Um, what we're not certain about is um, whether or not EPR programs improve the design of products to reduce environmental impact. There's just not uh, clear information there yet, although I will share some information on packaging um, from France later in the presentation. Um, typically, um, I think the issue has been that EPR has been um, implemented in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places. So the signals to producers and brands in terms of adjusting design are not very clear or straightforward. So if we wanna achieve that objective, I think we need to be more consistent across states and across countries to send clear signals. But what do we know? Um, so one of the things that's important to point out is that it's really hard to evaluate EPR program performance largely because the data is not that great. Um, the data is not great before programs. You may know from your own program, um, you know, you may not be collecting or reporting any information until the EPR program comes in place and then you have to track all of, the, uh, all of the data and information. So there's not a lot of pre-programmed data. There's also not a lot of data available in states that don't have EPR to kind of compare an EPR and a non-EPR state. Um, and on the financial question, there's really often limited visibility into local government um, budgets and sort of how they changed before and after an EPR program was in place. But with those challenges, um, we've still been able to assemble some data and reach some conclusions here. So I'm gonna share most of the information that I'm gonna share with you today 
is from a study that the Product Stewardship Institute did for the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection a number of years ago, looking at an evaluation of all of that state CPR program. So does it increase uh, recovery? Here you see on the left, um, the increase in e-waste collection, uh, the e-waste EPR program came into place in 2011. Um, and you can see pretty dramatic increases in uh, electronics recovery for a number of years um, and then leveling out a bit. That's to be expected, I think, as people clean out their basements and garages and things of that nature. Um, but you see pretty clear increase in recovery um, as a result of the program. Similarly, on the right hand side, very dramatic increase um, in recovery in 2015 as the mattress recycling. Um, it, uh, program came into effect and the uh, Mattress Recycling Council came into the state to operate the EPR program. Um, here on the top we're looking at thermostats. Um, in Connecticut, thermostat TRC uh, operated, the Thermostat Recycling Corporation operated a voluntary thermostat recovery program up until 2012 and in 2012 legislation made it um, mandatory. Um, so there has been collection in place for quite a long time, but what we do see is an increase after that mandatory requirement came into place, meaning all thermostat manufacturers um, had to participate in the take back through their distribution chains. We do see an increase um, in the recovery of those materials. Um, similarly, uh, in paint, um, what you see is prior to the program coming into effect in 2014, we had only data on oil-based paint, latex-based paint um, was not tracked or monitored, um, but so we see a, a pretty significant increase in recovery um, once the program came in place as latex uh, came through the system and wasn't going to disposal. Here um, we look at a number of states that have uh, EPR for paint and compare a number of them. As you can see, the most dramatic increase has happened in California. Um, the green uh, bar is the year of EPR inception. This is one of those cases where we can't find pre-programmed data for this material in most of these states. So we did the first year, uh, the, the year it came into play, the first full year, and then five years after implementation. And you see across the board, um, some places that increases are big, some places they're not as big, um, but they all have increases over time once EPR was implemented. Does it save money? Well, we did have good data in Connecticut on um, paint management costs. And you can see, yes, pretty dramatic change, uh, pretty dramatic savings uh, in local and state government paint management costs as that program came into effect. Um, and this slide uh, compares um, electronics recovery in a number of different states. And I need to provide a big caveat. You see that note on the lower right hand side here. Every state captures its um, data differently. The states that have EPR um, define the electronic stream differently. Some include residential, some only, some include schools and institutions, some include businesses, some include only small businesses. Um, they all include different ranges of, of electronics um, and, and that sort of thing. So it's not really an apples to apples comparison. Having said that, um, you see a pretty clear trend here that the structured EPR program, so these are the ones that meet those criteria that I laid out earlier. They have good performance standards, they have strong accountability measures, um, they have good oversight, all of those things. Um, they tend to be pretty high performing. Also pretty high performing are the ones with these asterisks like Colorado um, that have disposal bans. So that's really important in driving recycling as well. Um, as you get over to the lower performers, you see some that don't have EPR at all or that have less structured EPR programs. So these are ones where maybe it's not entirely clear who's responsible, maybe there are no performance targets um, and that sort of thing. So I find this interesting to look at to, sh to see kind of what the um, impact of different program structures are on performance and different policy elements. So we'll pause again here for questions on performance.
Great, thank you, Risa. I think performance standards are definitely a really important part of any policy, uh, any type of a program. So I encourage folks again, if you wanna get involved with the CDPHE study on extended producer responsibility and give some feedback on those types of things, um, you can sign up for that on the CDPH website and I will throw that link back into the chat. Risa, one of the, the questions that is bubbling around, we're talking about problematic materials that have largely been addressed for in the US through EPR, mattresses, electronics, plastics is really kind of rising to the top for a lot of us as a, as a problematic material. Can you talk, I know we're gonna, we're gonna jump into packaging and printed materials next, but do you know if there's any data around EPR for plastics in particular, or are we seeing momentum in this direction? Um, we're definitely seeing momentum and, and it's driving, um, I think driving a lot of the conversation in the U.S. around EPR for packaging and printed paper, um, since that's uh, a real, uh, plastics is such a big part of that stream and such an unrecovered part of that stream. We're also seeing some of the EPR for packaging and printed paper programs in Europe and in Canada expanding to include other single use plastics. Um, some had done so already adding things that um, are like packaging. So for example, Ziploc bags um, in certain provinces in Canada are covered because they are like packaging even though they are not actually packaging. Um, and so some, some of the programs had started, have started to move in that direction and we're seeing a trend further in that direction to capture more single use um, plastic items in those policies as changes move forward. Um, both Ontario and Quebec and Canada are considering program changes right now and I think that's something that'll be on the table. Great, and one more quick follow-up question. Jessica is asking about any EPR programs for textiles. That's something really interesting. We haven't seen it yet. I believe uh, there may be one program in France, if not, they've been talked about. Um, it's definitely an area that is ripe. Um, and we, RRS just issued a report on textiles for those of you who are interested. Um, uh, you should take a look at that. It really lays out um, where we are in textiles recovery and what's needed um, in order to move textiles recovery forward. I think EPR is a, is a, a very logical strategy for that. Um, but uh, there are, I think, maybe one or two models around the world, but not a lot. So that's an area that we could definitely focus on. Awesome, great questions, everyone. We're gonna let Risa keep going. Alrighty. So let's talk about packaging and printed paper. Um, so uh, EPR for packaging and printed paper, this is your standard curbside recycling materials or drop off recycling materials. You can see um, early on in, uh, you know, around 2000, we in North America, we just had bottle bills. We had no other um, EPR for packaging and printed paper. And it really was only in place in Europe. Um, what you see in the last 20 years is the concept has really expanded globally um, in Asia, uh, throughout all of Europe, and across Canada and some of the countries in South America. So it's really a growing, um, a growing policy trend. And what are some of the drivers for that? Um, there's a number of things uh, from the U.S. perspective in particular, but I think also other places around the world. We need stable funding um, to run good packaging and printed paper recycling programs. Um, there are challenges in the market. I think the combination of uh, the national sword, the impacts of the national sword policy and, and COVID and other things are making us really understand how vulnerable we are. Um, on the market basis and how those markets really affect uh, program costs on a um, on a regular basis and very dramatically and um, you know EPR the local governments have a really hard time um, responding to dramatic swings in pricing whereas a producer managed program has some more flexibility in that arena um, 
It's important to think about the focus on the circular economy. For those of you who have been following plastics and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the US Plastics Pact, which was announced yesterday, um, and all of these efforts, there are a lot of brands and companies out there that are saying, we want our materials back. We want circularity. We want to meet um, recyclability rec goals. We want to meet climate goals. We want to meet content goals. We need to get this material back. Um, and so they're more uh, increasingly, you know, coming to the table looking for solutions. Um, and lastly, you know, there have been a lot of us who've been working on this issue for a long time, right? We've all worked really hard and yet we're not moving the needle. Recycling rates have been stagnant for quite a long time. And so um, it's time to look for something different and EPR for packaging and printer paper may just be that thing. So um, as we're looking uh, at these programs, um, again, they all they fall all over the spectrum in terms of um, the uh, physical responsibility and financial responsibility, uh, but they all have these sort of three uh, structures in common. First, they're created uh, through legislation, and that legislation typically um, establishes the basic operating rules and the targets. And some of that, sort of that, um, where you fall on that spectrum of operational and financial responsibility is going to depend on how the legislation is crafted. Um, in uh, EPR for packaging programs are, are typically managed by producer responsibility organizations. In most countries, it's just one organization that manages um, the country or the provincial program, uh, but there are cases where there's more than one. They either target different regions of the country or different material groups. Um, and lastly, they're guided by a program plan, which is a really important tool um, for how the programs will come into play. So let's talk about the legislative structure. So we need to set some basic requirements for what the brand, the retailer, the producer needs to do. What is their responsibility? Do they actually have to operate the programs? Do they have to reimburse local governments? Um, you know, how is that going to work? Um, it also establishes uh, the performance standards. Are you going to go for recycling rates, material specific recycling rates? Are you going to have convenience standards, service standards, that sort of thing. Um, and then who's going to do the oversight to make sure that the system operates, um, that the, those targets are met, and that there's accountability in the instance that those targets are not met. A producer responsibility organization is really a critical part of the system here. Um, they are authorized in the legislation, and they essentially manage the obligation for the brands, retailers, uh, and producers who are obligated in the system. Um, so they uh, set the fees, they collect fees from those obligated entities, and they use those fees to implement the program plan and meet the targets and the obligations set in the legislation. So this gives you, this slide shows an example of a number of the different um, producer responsibility organizations for packaging operating around Europe and, um, and Canada. So I mentioned a program plan is a really critical part of, um, of any EPR program. It's really where the producer responsibility organization lays out its blueprint for how it's going to achieve the objectives of the legislation. That might mean they set a list of recyclables. That might mean they say we're going to enter into um, uh, arrangements with these collectors and these MRFs and these end market outlets. We're going to do this type of education. We're going to do end market development on these products, that sort of thing. But um, typically they go through a public participation process. Um, sorry, my cat's coming to visit here. And, uh, um, and they are approved by, um, by a state agency. So I mentioned um, that there's been a lot of discussion in the US around EPR for packaging, really much more active in the last couple of years, um, focused primarily on uh, the West Coast and um, in the New England area. Um, but I think a lot of discussion happening out there today, um, again, driven by those issues around um, limited local government resources um, and uh, limited resources to move things forward and increase recyclability and to meet those circularity goals. So I want to talk for a minute about 
um, what's been happening in Oregon. I think um, uh, Colorado and Oregon have some interesting similarities. Um, they are in the end of a process uh, to kind of revisit their whole approach to recycling policy in the state. Um, and so we thought it might make sense to um, walk you through a little bit of what they've been doing and, uh, and um, explain a little bit of the process they're going through. So um, you may be aware that uh, the national sword policy in China and other Asian import restrictions hit Oregon very hard. Um, they have a not very advanced processing system that um, was put in place to, uh, to um, really feed those export markets. And so um, when the restrictions hit, they were uh, really hard hit and forced in one of the most progressive recycling states in the country to, to allow landfilling of certain materials. So big, big problems hit by them. Um, so the state created this recycling steering committee to look at the problems the state was facing and come up with a new approach moving forward. So um, the steering committee was convened and they really started with, okay, let's look at what, what do we want our future recycling system to do? What are the functions we wanna see in that recycling system? And then what's the difference between what we wanna see and what we currently have in, in the state. Um, so a gap analysis. And then they hired us to help them look at other frameworks out there around the world um, and around the country that they might learn from to define their path moving forward. So we did an evaluation of 10 different frameworks um, focused on Europe, Canada, and the US. Uh, six of those were EPR based, four of them were uh, more conventional government managed. Um, and we evaluated those frameworks against what they were looking for in a function. And then um, we took everything we learned from looking at 10 different frameworks and we developed five scenarios. So they use the analysis, uh, or they use the analogy of Lego blocks. So we pulled out the Legos, the best performing Legos and put them back together in, the, in um, five different scenarios for them to consider. And then we did a deep evaluation of those five scenarios. Now the um, steering committee is, is working from those five scenarios and from that process and they're, they're defining a framework that's gonna be considered in the legislature in 2021. That process I think is coming to a close um, over the next couple of weeks. So what is a recycling framework? Just to give you a sense, it is um, a bunch of different elements designed to meet certain functions. So a framework is a, is a policy approach, a structure, um, uh, laws, policies, programs, agreements. So who is gonna pay for recycling? Who's gonna manage recycling? who's gonna decide what end markets are used, who's gonna decide how materials flow, all of those kinds of things. So it's, think of it as a sort of a policy approach. So just to give you a sense of the five scenarios that we developed for them, um, we, they were followed a spectrum basically from a couple of government managed scenarios that were sort of, what if you just took the best practices for local government managed and government managed programs and applied them in Oregon? And that's kind of what the enhanced government management and state government management managed pieces do. And then as you go to the right, we get into the realm of extended producer responsibility. So we looked at what if the producers were responsible just from the gate of the MRF? On. And what if producers were responsible, uh, local government still operated programs, but producers are responsible for financing. And then lastly, what if producers are responsible for both financing and operational responsibilities? What would that look like in Oregon? So we developed these five scenarios um, for them to consider. As we were doing that, um, we came up with a number of, uh, the group came up with a number of research questions. Um, and it's surprising that all the talk about uh, EPR for packaging and printed paper, a lot of this stuff hasn't really been um, compiled or published. So they asked us to look at four 
different research questions. And I'm gonna share the results of these analyses with you now. Um, so looking at, does EPR for packaging improve recycling rates? Does it stabilize markets? Does it increase the cost of groceries or packaged goods? Um, and then uh, does it improve the recyclability or the design of packaging? So um, remember I mentioned earlier, it's really tricky to do um, uh, comparisons of pre and post EPR program uh, in different places because there's not a lot of good pre-program data. Um, we were able to find five EPR, uh, five jurisdictions with EPR for packaging and printed paper that had reasonably um, uh, complete data and comparable data for pre and pro post program implementation. And what you see here is that across the board, um, in every instance, there was an increase in the recycling rate after EPR for packaging and printed paper was implemented. Some of those increases are huge, some are not as huge, but they all have an increase. Um, we also looked at uh, how does EPR for packaging impact recycling market stability. And the way we approach this was um, looking at what happened to recycling programs post national sword implementation um, uh, in EPR jurisdictions and not non-EPR jurisdictions. And we looked at um, Canada uh, the Canadian provinces, where there are five uh, provinces that have EPR um, and a couple that do not. And then we looked at the U.S. states that border EPR provinces in Canada, thinking, you know, they probably have similar recycling market conditions. So what we found was that there was no meaningful change in the recycling programs in the provinces in Canada that have EPR. The one Canadian province where there was uh, reduced access, and this was mostly for um, a variety of plastic resins, was in Alberta, which does not have EPR, but is currently studying its implementation potentially um, over the next few years. And we also found a number of US states where there was pretty significant changes um, to recycling programs. Oregon was one of those, Washington another, the Pacific Northwest again being pretty hard hit given the uh, reliance on export markets there. So how does um, EPR impact the price of, of products? So what we did to answer this question was we actually did a virtual shopping exercise and we picked two cities uh, we, we picked a number of pairs of cities, uh, so one that have similar demographics, one in an EPR jurisdiction and one in a non-EPR jurisdiction, and we shopped for the same list of products in both of those jurisdictions, and then we compared um, the prices of those products. And what we found was in the vast majority of instances, the prices were the same, whether or not EPR for packaging was in place in that jurisdiction. Um, we also found that there were uh, more instances of higher prices in provinces that don't have EPR than there were instances of higher prices in provinces that do have EPR. Um, so this really indicates that the, pro the price of products is, uh, depends on a variety of different things and that the, the cost of the EPR for packaging program is not enough to drive pricing strategies. So um, this is the, the look we did at um, how EPR for packaging impacts products, product design. Um, and the, the, the one working example we have here is in France, the producer responsibility organization there is called CITIO. Um, and essentially, they, uh, they use a system called eco-modulated fees, meaning that they provide bonuses um, or discounts, essentially, to packaging they want to incentivize people to use or practices they want to incentivize, and they, um, they uh, charge disruptor fees or malices to uh, products or packages, or packages that are problematic in the system. So what you see here is pretty interesting. Um, uh, 
uh, on the left, the increase in packaging with sorting instructions. So they give a bonus if you use, uh, if you provide a recycling instruction. So picture something similar to the how to recycle label. So you can see when they started giving that, um, that bonus, people started providing that instruction. So very effective incentive there. And on the right, um, you see the impact of the source reduction incentive, um, uh, which is just basically for material reduction over time. Again, pretty clear trend. Uh, similarly, so these are some of the disruptors that they've identified in France. So they um, essentially get charge a penalty if you put a PVC bottle onto the market because that's a disruptor in the recycling system. And you can see when that penalty came into, a pl into place, the amount of uh, PVC bottles dropped by two thirds. On the right, a uh, similar disruptor for uh, PET that has aluminum components. You know, if any of you have seen those, there are, there are PET cans essentially with aluminum closures. Um, and again, after that disruptor came into play, um, the use of uh, PET bottles with aluminum dropped by 50%. So um, that closes out the, the, some of the research. I just wanted to end this um, portion and talking about packaging and printed paper to just talk for a second about the changes in the perspective of the packaging industry that we're seeing. Um, I think, again, they're driven by circularity. They're feeling the pressure on plastics. Um, plastics in the ocean, and they're recognizing that that the current system, you know, after seven or eight years of the recycling partnership and the closed loop fund um, and really great efforts, you know, again, they're still not getting back what they need um, to achieve those circularity goals that something's got to give. Um, and, uh, you know, that old adage, you'd rather be um, at the table than on the menu. I think, uh, I think some of that is driving this as well. So we've seen recent positions come out from AmeriPen um, and from the Consumer Brands Association. Uh, both of these are brand owner, packager organizations. Um, and the, let me just be clear, these do not promote EPR by any stretch, but they're they're putting out there a number of different ways of looking at financing uh, recycling programs and really indicating an openness towards these issues that we haven't seen before. And I don't think this is the end. I think we're gonna see more over the next couple months of those uh, brand organizations really putting some creative thinking around what can they actually live with and not just brands, some of the haulers and others who are involved in this as well. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll take some questions about packaging. Awesome. We give Risa a chance to catch her breath and get some water. She's doing a great job. It's a lot to be able to talk for that long. We're going to do another polling question. So if we could get that up for folks, we are interested in which material you think Colorado should prioritize for EPR policy. We've talked about some of these already and unfortunately we can't have an other category but if you do have other ideas please throw that into the chat. Risa I want to ask you there's been a couple of questions regarding electronics so mm -hmm. Colorado has a disposal ban on electronics that we've had for a number of years. The chart that you showed our data on electronics collection was pretty strong I think we were number two on that chart uh, and I know the numbers are not apples to apples, but can you talk about, you know, is, is an electronics ban sufficient? Would EPR, would we expect to see increased recovery? And sort of how does, how does EPR work with other potential policy tools like a disposal ban in general? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of incorporating disposal bans in EPR policies. I think it's, um, I think it's good to sort of say, you know, the producer has to pay for the program and the consumer has to participate in it. Um, so to me, that's a, a good balance of responsibilities. Um, so I think it's good policy to incorporate both and a number of electronic programs like the one in New York do that. Um, would you see more recovery? Um, that's hard to say. I think the question I would ask you is, um, you know, it, do you have the resources to continue to collect electronics at the level that you do? If it ain't broke, don't fix it, <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, there are a lot of voluntary um, 
take back programs from producers. And if that's working for you in combination with a disposal ban, I think that's okay. If there's a resource concern or um, if it's a stressor on programs or on individuals, then I think looking for that additional financing um, from producers might make sense. And there was a clarifying question about the recycling markets. Can you clarify, did EPR oh, yeah. in, in Canada really help keep the market stable or, or help them better respond to marketing challenges? I forgot that we were going to be on at noon. I have a fire. <laughs> oh, sorry. I usually don't schedule meetings at noon. Um, uh, so the what happened in the EPR program, so in um, most of the, the uh, materials that had been dropped in programs in the US and in Alberta were materials that are recyclable, but the cost out um, far outweighs the revenue. And so in an EPR program, the producer is responsible for covering that cost. And so what we found is that the, the producer responsibility organization essentially absorbed that cost. It might have meant some storage of materials over time, but for the most part, the materials um, moved and were recovered. In, uh, in US programs where there's not that stable funding base, the MRFs um, couldn't absorb the additional cost of handling those um, without changes to their contracts and their agreements with suppliers and that sort of thing. So it was an economic problem. And so the solution that was reached in a lot of these areas was, well, let's take out those really low value materials out of the system to um, reduce the cost and improve the performance. Does that make sense? Did that address the question? So it sounds like the very short answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, because it's cost uh, it, it was really cost. It's not that the, they created new markets. It's that they covered the cost um, needed to access the markets that exist. That's a great point. And just a, a quick follow up. Some of these are really great questions that we will have a, an extended period of, of questions and answers with Risa in just a few slides. So we will get to some of these great questions. One more question about just sort of what's happening across the country is about about the map you showed about who's looking at EPR policy and we see it is largely on the coast. Uh, is that due to access to markets or, or shipping issues or, or can you speak to why we're seeing that? Um, well, I think, um, I think on the west coast it is um, driven by uh, market disruption um, and cost increases due to um, the, the import restrictions in Asia. Um, in the Northeast, we weren't really impacted by that, but the cost increases um, in the programs have been significant. And we have a lot of recycling mandates in the Northeast. So I think this is a factor as well. In places where you have, recycling is mandatory and the cost of recycling is going up and up and up because of that combination of um, the new market uh, requirements, uh, slower down processing, higher processing costs, lower material values, yet you as a local government don't have the choice to cancel the program, that increases the pressure. So I think um, mandatory recycling um, drives that a bit as well. And we also are, are uh, both um, here in the Northeast and on, on the West Coast um, also are quite familiar with EPR and have used it in a number of different um, avenues and so sort of see the value of that kind of approach moving forward. Great, so thanks for everybody for participating in our poll. We see a uh, plastics is the clear winner with over half of the votes. Uh, it is also included as part of packaging and printed materials so it really ran away with that one and mattresses and electronics came in a, a decent pace as well. So Great feedback from everyone, and that'll be great feedback for CDPHE as part of their study as well. So with that, I will turn it back over to Risa, and we'll be jumping into Q&A, uh, more extended Q&A here in just a few minutes. Okay, great. Um, 
So I uh, just want to talk a couple minutes about some of the challenges as you think about moving forward with EPR. Um, I think the biggest challenge is it really requires a different mindset um, in terms of who's responsible. So state and local governments, we've felt responsible, I'm putting my state hat back on, um, we've felt responsible for moving recycling forward. Um, and, uh, and we've felt responsible for implementing these programs. And, and a lot of, this, of us are very invested in our programs, right? We've done great things and, um, and for good reason. But to move forward uh, with EPR, you really need to shift that approach and say, okay, um, you know, I wanna be comfortable with the producers coming in and potentially doing things differently um, and, and my role changing. So I'm not operating my program anymore, but I'm consulting with someone who's operating my program. Um, one of the most challenging things I think is finding the proper balance of responsibility, authority, and accountability. So if the producers are paying for these programs, should they get to decide how they're implemented? Um, uh, should they, you know, what do they get to decide? What don't they? Is it uh, just write check and, you know, and then um, that's the end of it? Or should they have more um, sort of decision-making authority there? And then um, from the government or service provider perspective, um, you know, what accountability is required there? Should you have to meet certain program standards or requirements to get reimbursement or to get producer funding um, under an EPR program? So if it's packaging, do you, should, should you be required to collect certain materials, do, uh, implement certain collection and education best practices, those kinds of things? In my opinion, that's the, that's the most challenging thing is kind of changing our brain around to think about what's our role, what's the industry's role, what's the service provider's role, and who gets to make which decisions. Um, engaging industry is key to that. Um, and um, in many of these uh, products and packages prior to EPR, they had no involvement at all in end of life. And so that's a process in and of itself. Um, but, you know, I think that we're going to continue to need to think about moving this forward because these drivers are pretty strong. Um, the government budget challenges are continuing and worse under COVID. Um, so, you know, it was, it was uh, we were hit pretty hard by the import restrictions in Asia and now hit again um, by challenges of COVID. Um, the, uh, you know, we're the market challenges, there are markets for a lot of materials in the stream that don't come anywhere near covering the costs of uh, collection and processing. So um, how are we going to get that material? How are we going to improve those economics? Um, from the business leader perspective, how are they going to get back the material they need to meet their goals? Uh, if you looked at the goals of the plastic, the U.S. Plastics Pact yesterday, holy cow, like that's a big lift in the next five years um and you know how are we going to do that and um you know when we look at uh at, at the ground right now even the most aggressive states and local governments that have really strong um very uh advanced policy approaches are really again not moving the needle a lot of us have worked really hard for a really long time and we're kind of stuck where we are so let's not you know um, let's not live to the Einstein definition of insanity here and keep trying the same thing and expecting a different outcome. Maybe it's time to try something different. So um, some thoughts on where you might want to go from here. Um, in New York, the Product Stewardship Council has been a terrific catalyst. Um, as I mentioned, we've gotten five uh, pieces of legislation passed. We've started really serious discussions around plastics and packaging um, and have active bills going into next year among other products. Um, it, the council can be a really powerful tool for raising awareness, for bringing people together to set priorities, um, to identify what's the most important thing for your state um, and to target that and then to engage people to move it forward. Um, and then lastly, you know, there is that whole spectrum of different ways to manage and implement EPR programs. So, you know, you can start thinking about what works best for Colorado. What's that combination of financial and operational responsibility that's going to work best for you? So 
I think that about wraps it. Kate, you wanna go into some of the other questions? Oh yeah, we got lots of questions, so. All right. Hopefully you won't have many more fire alarms on your end. That's no, no, it's usually just at noon, sorry. That's great. Um, thank you, Risa. That really was fantastic. EPR is a very complex topic. Every time I learn more about them, I just amaze at the diversity of programs around the around the world for all different types of materials. And so it really is a lot of information to cover. Uh, we will have access to the slides so people will be able to look back on some of those great graphs and all this information. And again, this will be one of many discussions we will be having as part of looking at how do we evolve and consider EPR for Colorado. So with that, we've got a lot of questions coming through. Uh, we do have one last poll question that we'll throw up for our audience. Uh, Risa, I wanted to start first with just a quick question about the national level. Do we think it makes sense to have EPR at the national level, particularly when perhaps around plastics where there seems to be a lot of momentum? What are you seeing or feeling coming out of that? Well, I think that would be ideal. Um, and there are certainly a lot of folks on the industry side who are looking at that as a possibility. Um, personally, you know, with a Congress that can't really agree to turn the lights on, it doesn't seem to me um, that that's a great first step. I think, um, you know, we don't have a US model yet. And so I think like many other things, um, uh, the, uh, starting, uh, and, and I'm talking about packaging now, starting for plastics and packaging um, on a state level and is going to make more sense and be more likely. However, you know, I think there are some good discussions happening at the federal level. And if there were momentum there, I think that would be ideal. Great. So as we think about moving forward in Colorado, in the absence of, of potential national consensus around things. One of the ideas that's been discussed is, is this idea of a framework legislation. So, mm -hmm. so Maine has sort of an all-encompassing policy to support EPR. Can you talk a little bit about the pros and cons of that framework approach and, and where you've seen that in place? Sure. Um, so uh, the benefit and, and uh, is that you want a structure um, that allows you to add products and packages over time that is more streamlined than going through a new legislative process every year. So that, that is a great idea. Um, the only place that's implemented, as you mentioned, is Maine. And the way that works is they, the legislature passed this policy. Um, and then what it, what it says that they do is that the legislature passes a resolution directing the agency to develop legislation on a um, product or, or uh, packaging uh, kind of framework. So, um, so it is streamlined in that it's a, it sets up a process for how that'll be considered. But in every instance, the legislature directs the agency, the agency comes back with a bill, and then the bill is still um, debated in, in the way any bill is. So, um, so it's a step in the right direction, but, um, but it's, uh, it's challenging and it still requires multiple steps to get anything added. So it's not, most legislatures in my experience don't want to give the administration in a state the authority to create a new program like this. They want to ultimately sign off on it. So, so the way, that's the way the framework has played out. If you have a situation where the legislature would say, here's the product stewardship policy and allow the agency to add materials or products um, that meet certain criteria through regulation, I think that would be, um, you know, that would be great. But I haven't seen any legislatures really willing to do that. Um, I've talked to some legislative folks who really want to move in this direction because, you know, after, especially in, in some of the states that are more active, they really get EPR fatigue. Like, why are you coming back to me again? Didn't we talk to you about this already? Just, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but every product it, is slightly different and needs a slightly different approach. Um, but, you know, one thing you could do is you could do sort of an omnibus bill where you had a number of things that are 
common among all products, like what are the requirements for a producer responsibility organization, what are the requirements for a plan, you know, and that sort of thing, um, and then have each product added as a different section of that legislation. So there are ways you could streamline it, um, but it's really challenging for those, uh, for two reasons, just to summarize. One is that it brings out all of the opponents, all of the opponents of anything that you might ever want to consider under EPR will come out and oppose it. And then the other is, um, you know, that getting the legislature to give that authority over to the agency is tough. And if you don't do that, then you wind up sort of in a similar situation uh, with having to go back for authorization for each product. Great, so that ties into our next question about just sort of bringing everybody to the table. Um, and that really feels like a, an important step forward. And there is, as you mentioned, evolving perspective, particularly among industry about the role of EPR and particularly how EPR should be crafted um, mm -hmm. and put together. And I know you talked about the New York Product Stewardship Council being not just local government, but actually a broader stakeholder group can you talk about any other models or successful programs where really everybody has come to the table um, so nobody does feel on the menu and yet has still resulted in, you know, EPR legislation? Um, any sort of advice that, that models that have been helpful in, in sort of the discussion phase of things, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think actually paint care is the strongest example of that where the Product Stewardship Institute um, worked with the um, American Coatings Association to do a series of dialogues between the industry and local government and other stakeholders that resulted in the paint care model legislation um, that has now passed uh, in 10, 11 states around the country. Um, so I think that's the best sort of operating model. I think uh, you know, and that is an intensive process, years um, and lots of investment in, uh, you know, facilitation, meeting and that sort of thing. Um, I think there are effective negotiations around different pieces of legislation. Um, those can be led by a product stewardship council. They can be led by a legislature who is interested. They can be led by a state agency. Um, uh, who wants to show some leadership in this area where they, you know, whoever the convening entity is says, hey, we want to move in this direction um, and we want to create the best policy we can. Let's bring everyone together to do that. The Oregon uh, Recycling Steering Committee is an excellent example of that where it's convened by the Oregon DEQ, um, but it's really driven by the membership and chaired uh, jointly by someone from DEQ and someone from the Haulers Association. Uh, and they've sat down and worked for a couple of years, really working through all the different issues and all the different options. And, and they'll be coming out with a, with a policy approach, which hopefully, um, if not consensus, will bring most of the people along. So there are lots of different ways you can go at it. And lots of different places that are, are a little ahead of us, so we can learn from them as well, which is always exactly, a yeah. benefit. Um, great, poll results. Um, so it looks like folks are generally very interested in learning more, um, both supporting the CBPHE study, doing some more webinars and resources to inform ourselves, our legislators and others. So great, we will stay tuned for, for more to come on the EPR front. And we have a couple more questions for Risa here in our last few minutes. One of our questions is about recycling processes processors and recycling markets that are already in the state. Mm -hmm. um, how, how can we make sure that, that EPR policies sort of support those, those markets and those processors and how can we ensure also better communication on, on product design and things that, that are challenging for those markets and processors? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that gets down to the questions around structure and decision making. So, um, for example, in most of the Canadian EPR for packaging programs, the way programs run hasn't changed very much in Manitoba, in Ontario, um, in Quebec. 
municipalities run programs. They use the MRFs that they've typically used and enter into those arrangements. Then the producers, um, through the producer responsibility organization, finance the collection and processing done um, by those uh, by those entities. So in those cases, existing MRFs and, and those existing contractual and other relationships stay in place. Um, there are situations like in Recycle BC where they established essentially a new set of contractual obligations and relationships and um, some of the existing infrastructure was utilized, some of it was repurposed under the new system, and some was mothballed. And, uh, but that's the result of the decision that they made and how they want to implement the program. So if maintaining that local um, processing infrastructure is a priority, then you need to bring that into your policy making approach and really think about um, the, the management structures that allow for that. In terms of the design issues, the, um, you know, the only example we have, and as I, I showed the data before, it's a fairly powerful example that, um, that fees, uh, packaging fees that uh, incentivize good design and penalize bad design appear to be working. And so um, you may want to think about a policy that directs the producer organizations to use that kind of a fee setting mechanism so that there is some feedback on some of those disruptor packages, some of those problem packages, um, so that the fees into the system are higher. Yeah, those fees are a really interesting component because I think of EPR really as it sort of in my mind as mandatory because it's legislated, but then you look at these different components like the fees and the bonuses that are really voluntary drivers under under a policy umbrella. So it seems like there's a, a lot of different components. There's a lot of different ways to, to put things into place. Right. And you could direct in the statute that the producer responsibility organization has to consider certain factors while setting fees. So you could, even though the fee setting is done by the organization, you can set requirements in the statute that their fees meet certain objectives and do it that way. So as we're trying to come up to speed on EPR, I have a great question about communications, materials, campaigns to sort of raise the visibility of EPR. Have you seen other states we might, might look toward, we've talked about on the policy front, but just sort of on the like communicating about EPR, talking to legislators, talking to each other, mm -hmm. uh, things we might consider there. Yeah, I mean, in New York, we developed a, a suite of uh, materials that we use to reach out. And our website is kind of, you know, it's it's not very advanced or anything, but, um, but you know, some key talking points and things like that. Again, the Product Stewardship Institute um, can provide a lot of that information um, and uh, other state um, uh, product stewardship councils. California Product Stewardship Council is pretty, substantial. Um, and then there's the National Product Stewardship Action Council, which is uh, sort of the national arm of the California group that um, that also provides uh, resources and information and more on the campaign sort of end of things. So I would look at those resources. Awesome. And so we all know recycling markets have been a big topic of conversation and something we are looking to build, uh, improve upon in Colorado. So question about whether EPR policies typically require manufacturers to then use those recycled materials or, you know, is it our minimum content standards a complementary policy? How do these two, uh, both the collection and the, the end markets, how do they fit together? Um, so there's two things. One is um, a, a lot of the EPR for packaging programs uh, have a set aside a portion of, um, of the funding for market development or problem solving kinds of things. So the best example is that in Ontario, the Continuous Improvement Fund, which, uh, which basically sets aside 
a certain amount of funding to make sure the programs continuously improve. Or in um, Quebec, EEQ, uh, for example, made an investment, I believe it was $13 million investment in a number of MRFs to improve the recovery of glass, the quality of glass, so that it was then marketable to um, markets within in the province. So there are, no, uh, there are typically tools within the producer responsibility organization's toolbox to make those kinds of investments to improve markets. Um, on minimum content standards, that's not something that has historically been included in EPR for packaging programs in Europe and Canada, but it's something that nearly every state um, that I've seen having these conversations is, is talking about them in tandem, either as the same bill or in a companion piece of legislation. So I think um, there's definitely dialogue around that and there are some models out there for what that might look like legislatively. Great. And one last question. Um, it was a great conversation, by the way. Thanks to everyone for joining us. This has been absolutely great conversation. Of course, again, one of many that we'll have. Um, but just kind of wanted to close out about asking some uh, about working with some of the manufacturers that are really out there talking more openly about EPR, some of, the, some of the maybe the smaller, um, we have some leaders in natural foods, people mm -hmm. like that who are, are taking more of a lead. Are, are you seeing programs that are, are developing around them or as more as a carrot approach than a stick? Um, anything in that regard about working with just a smaller set of manufacturers? Um, you know, I, I think, um, there are certainly uh, lots of examples in the glass world of, of folks getting um, directly involved um, in the recovery of glass, um, not seen as much on plastics or more broadly. Um, I think, uh, you know, the Recycling Partnership and the Closed Loop Fund was the place where those progressive groups who wanted to improve, pro progressive companies that wanted to improve recycling kind of came to the table. And I think, um, you know, there are uh, sort of subsets within those groups that are really starting to realize that if they want scale, they um, they need to move to something that's more policy driven. So I think we'll see the, the nature of those conversations change, but I definitely would encourage you. Oh, and I should explain, I also mention things like um, polystyrene recovery uh, and that sort of thing, Ex expanded polystyrene recovery drop-off programs and sponsorship of those um, has been done on a voluntary basis. So there are certain products and certain packages that have had these kinds of targeted impacts um, and they're certainly, you know, worth pursuing for sure if you have those local interests. But I think as a whole, you know, the conversation is starting to move and some of these folks you're talking about are driving the national conversation in a, in a more active way. Absolutely. This conversation is definitely moving across the country. So thrilled that you could be here today and guide us as Colorado through um, as we consider what is our role in this. So great to catch up to speed on what is happening elsewhere. One last plug to get involved for the, the CPHE study on EPR. Uh, check out that link in the chat box. And with that, I will turn it over to Brandy to wrap us up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Risa. Thank you so much, Kate. That was such a wonderful session as we knew it would be. Um, such great information for our state to pay attention to and um, you know, follow some of, of these folks lead. So just lots of cool stuff to come, that's for sure. So as we leave this session, remember that there are business partner showcase uh, options to go check out. Definitely don't miss the meet and greets, uh, especially because Governor Polis is going to pop in. So that's pretty cool. And then of course, the sessions this afternoon. So again, thank you so much and have a good rest of your summit. Bye.